for this first session in the Administrator Forum Series. We will be providing other sessions throughout the 2023-2024 school year, and we look forward to your participation in future exactly. sessions. Mm -hmm. These sessions are a collaboration between the Early Childhood Development Department at the Illinois State Board of Education and Early Childhood Professional Learning, also known as ECPL, which is a project of the Center Resources for Teaching and Learning. My name is Cindy Berry, and I'm Program Director for Early Childhood Professional Learning. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Please be sure your name in the participant list is the same first and last name you use to register for this session. We need this for attendance purposes. If necessary, please edit your name to ensure we are able to confirm your attendance. Today's session will be recorded and the recording will be posted on the ECPL YouTube channel within the upcoming week. We've got a lot of participants in this session. So in, due to the, the, the large number of participants, your microphones will be muted throughout the session. However, the chat will remain open for your comments and questions. We ask that you please remain in the session to hear some important information about upcoming events. And at this point, I would like to introduce Jenny Metcalf, who is a principal consultant in the Early Childhood Development Department at the Illinois State Board of Education. Take it away, Jenny. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's so nice to see so many of my favorite administrators in one spot and some people that I haven't met yet. So I'm Jenny Metcalf. I've been with the State Board of Education for nine plus years. Um, I work primarily with Preschool for All, Preschool for All Expansion, and I am joined by Maddie Kulik, one of our newer consultants who is um, helping me with monitoring as well. We are so glad that you guys can join us. Can't believe it's another year. Um, before we get started, I want to put a plug in because even though I love to see you all virtually, I would love to see you in person. So we are actually going to be having an in-person preschool for all, preschool for all expansion administrator meeting in July, it, or July, April, April 22nd and 23rd. You will see some more information about that. You may have already seen the save the date. All the ISB consultants will be there. We would love for as many administrators as possible to be there. So please put that in your calendar. It will be in Champaign, Illinois. I already see people are excited. We're excited too. So let's get started with our uh, content of our webinar today. So as we, many of you know, you've heard me do this webinar for years now. Um, the compliance checklist is obviously very detailed. Um, we could never get it done in a, like an hour and a half session. <laughs> So we have selected items that programs ask us a lot about. Um, we are going to address those. Please put your um, questions in the chat. As you can imagine with this amount of people, we can't always get to every question. And some of them are like really specific and that we need to make sure we have the, the right guidance to give you. So if you do not get your question answered, please send your question to early chai, early chi, at isb.net, like as soon as this webinar is over and we will make sure we get back to you. But we will try to um, get to them as much as possible today. Next slide. So um, besides the compliance checklist um, items, I just wanna talk a little bit about the monitoring process itself. Next slide, Susie. So many of you are probably on here because you got a um, letter that you're going to be monitored this year. So all the notifications for monitoring have already gone out. So if your authorized official or and your program contact did not get an email at the end of August saying that you were being monitored this year, then you are not being monitored. So everyone who's being monitored has already been notified. Um, I will address the fact that people have been asking us. We you know, we have no set cycle for monitoring. I think there's a rumor that we do, but we don't. Um, and so our goal is always to monitor programs more frequently, just for accountability purposes, accountability to the money that we get from the legislation and um, for continuous quality improvement. So there are programs this year who were monitored two years ago. That's not a mistake. It's accurate. We're trying to monitor programs 
more often. I know um, that monitoring is a stressful process and we don't want you to think of it as we're coming in there to take your money away or anything like that. It's never the intention. Um, we contract with a separate or entity, um, National Lewis University, their external monitors, they don't work for ISB. They're really there to just assess what's happening in the current program. Anything about your grant money, anything that comes from your visit, that all happened, you know, from ISB early childhood. Um, so they're really there just to complete the compliance checklist and to observe your classrooms. All classrooms will be monitored this year with Acker's observation. So we won't be at this point in time, we will not be pooling names all classrooms for PFA and PFAE will be monitored. You should have already, if you're being monitored, received um, an initial communication from NLU. They do need you to submit the documents, the site documents that they send as soon as possible. It helps us with scheduling, um, knowing how many classrooms everyone has and things like that. So if you have not submitted your documents back to NLU, please do so as soon as possible. Mandy, are there any questions about, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, about, there was one question. Um, it said, so if someone has, for instance, six classrooms, they'll be going into all six classrooms for an entire session? For a three hour expert's observation, yes. Um, also, if you have any changes to your program contact, so you know in your e-grant, you list your program contact. If your program contact changes in the middle of the year, please email earlychildisb.net so that the monitoring reports can be sent to the um, proper people. And the monitoring reports always go to the authorized official and the program contact. There is a compliance checklist that is one per grantee. And then there'll be an Eckers report for every classroom. And then there will be a facility report if you have more than one classroom, that's kind of like a bar graph of each of your classes. I think someone asked again about the, um, yes, we're being, mo we're monitoring or doing an Eckers observation on every classroom. Next slide. Oh. oh, go ahead, Maddie. Jenny, I was just gonna say, somebody said if their enrollment changes, do they need to resubmit that paperwork to uh, NLU? You can, you can send the initial paperwork to them and then you can update it when you get your three week window, which, leads me into the three week window process. So all programs will be given a three week window. A lot of a lot of programs already called me and said that the email, initial email didn't say a month. That's correct. We do not, NLU schedules monthly. So you will not be notified of your three week window until three to four weeks before your window. So if you're being monitored in April, you're not gonna hear until uh, March. So it's three to four weeks before your three-week window. And when you're given your three-week window, you can pick three blackout days. Blackout days are not days that you as a district or organization already have closed. So like Martin Luther King, if you're closed for that day, that's not counting one of your blackout days. But if you are going on a field trip and you want to select that, that would be an example of a reason you would pick a blackout day. Any questions about that, Maddie? Um, not that I can see. I think you addressed those. Okay. And then just a reminder, and those of you who may be new, um, after the monitoring reports are sent, you have 30 days to complete your continuous quality improvement plan, which we call the CQIP. The CQIP is um, two documents. One is the compliance CQIP, which addresses all your um, non-compliance items and then your Ecker sequence. Please make sure that when you get the monitoring reports that you read the document that's linked called Ecker's sequip step-by-step because that will explain to you how to do the Ecker sequip. We're only looking for five items, five focus areas in the Ecker's and there are certain focus categories that we want you to focus on in your first year. We do not want to see items one to seven in an ECHR CQIP in your first year. Those are things that you as a program can't typically control, like the size of your rooms 
or something on your playground. We want you to focus on the things you can control. So that would be anything 12 and up. We in Illinois do not assess personal care routines. So if you're looking at the Eckers book, items 8, 9, 10, and 11, we do not assess those when we come out to the classroom. If you need, hold on one second, Maddie. If you need an extension on this equip, um, you can always email your consultant and just tell them that you need a little more time. That's perfectly acceptable. Go ahead, Maddie. Sorry. That's okay. I was just gonna read you a couple of the questions. Yeah. Um, sure. First one was, uh, will both AM and PM sessions be monitored? It's only one per physical classroom. So if you have a teacher, if you have the same teacher who moves classrooms from AM to PM, then yes, they will be assessed because it's based off of the physical classroom. But if they just have an AM and PM in the same room, only once. Um, and then there were some more specific ones, like how can they be sure that they're either being monitored or not being monitored this year because they might've changed roles, I would say to email uh, early chai uh, at isb.net and then we can confirm that for you. Yeah, definitely. And also, I want to mention that accelerate ratings that we give out, they do not come until the summer following the monitoring year. So I know that's a long wait, but you won't get your accelerate rating when you get your monitoring reports. That won't come until the summer following. So just don't, um, just so you know, it won't be in the letter. All right, next slide. So as I mentioned, we're just going to talk about the um, items that are most important, um, or not most important, but that we get the most questions about. I did also want to mention um, regarding compliance items is that when you have your monitoring visit, you will have an exit interview. Somebody in your program will have an exit interview with the assessor who does the compliance checklist. And they will tell you if something is missing, like a document. They won't tell you if something's in compliance, but they'll tell you if something's missing. For example, you don't have your suspension policy. They'll give you like a little time to go find it. Like if you forgot to put it in your binder or something. Um, but this is not, the exit interview won't tell you, for example, that your lesson plans are out of compliance. They'll just say whether you're missing the lesson plans. So just wanted to note that. Also, I want to, one more thing about Eckers that I always like to say, people probably hear me say this a lot, um, Eckers is not compliance. So Eckers is a quality observation tool. We do not expect you to have all sevens. We don't even expect you to like have to fix everything. That's why we only have you pick five items um, that really are important to your program. So just want to point that out. The compliance checklist is, you know, part of the funding requirements. And so those are things that you have to correct as soon as possible. Okay, I think that we, unless we have any questions, Manny, do we have any questions? We do have one. It said, um, will the compliance, that meeting afterwards, will it be at the end of each day or at the end of the window of monitoring? It's at the end of the visit or at least the end of the compliance part because for, for programs that are larger, there tends to be more than one assessor that comes out. Some just do the classrooms, and then there's what we call the compliance uh, lead. And that's the person that's collecting everything from, you know, the classroom assessors that might be specific to the classroom, like your children files. And then they're putting everything together. So that person will, um, when they're done collecting every compliance item, that's when they will talk to um, the administrator. Monitoring visits are typically performed in the school year. Sometimes we will monitor programs late May and June if they're a community child care center that's open um, 12 months. The, the amount of days that the assessors are out there really depends on the size of your program. Like some of you know that you who have big programs that were out there for like two weeks. Um, but typically, um, you know, it just really depends. And I also want to mention substitutes. Um, 
because of the large amount of programs that we monitor, we cannot, A, we cannot make accommodations to the schedule. So like if you want to be monitored like in May, like we can't, we can't accommodate that. So we, we have to monitor whenever NLU is able to, um, to fit that in. And then, I almost lost my train of thought with all these questions coming in. Maddie, what? Um, I'm seeing questions like, when's the soonest we can be monitored? Are monitoring visits performed during June, July, and August? Uh, yeah, that one I addressed. So monitoring visits um, are starting next week. So if you already have your three-week window, you already know about it. So don't worry, no one's going to show up next week if you haven't already been told. Um, but we have um, already notified people of that. And then there's some requests for substitute uh licensing which we'll address later in the yeah i did want to finish i um, saying about subs too we do monitor subs so we are we have gotten better for those of you who haven't been monitored in, in maybe three or four years if the if a substitute like calls in sick or a, a teacher calls in sick and there's a sub in that room and the assessors are going to come back later in the week because you're a larger program we will hold off on monitoring that classroom until your teacher is back. So we will, you just need to, you need to just uh, communicate with the assessors. We will do everything in our power to like, to be accommodating about substitutes. But if you're only a one classroom um, program, we, there's not much we can do about that. And if, you're, if your teacher's on maternity leave or something like that, there's nothing we can do about that. But if you have a teacher who just called in sick for that day, we can, if you have more than one class, and we will do what we can to um, to accommodate. The the emails about your monitoring window come from Sarah Hassan. You probably already, H-A-S-A-N, you probably already got emails from her. Um, she's our scheduling manager at NLU. I know there's like a lot of questions I don't want to keep delaying, but is there anything, big, Maddie, that I need to... I th I think we're caught up. I, I, I know I do see a lot of other ones in there. If um we're gonna move on to the items, but if at, towards the end you can re set, put your question in if we have time, or like I said, um send it to early June. All right, Maddie, take it away. Okay. Um. So item number one on the compliance checklist is about staff slash child ratio and class size. Um, there's a maximum of 20 children per session, but you must have a minimum of 15, uh, and programs should be striving to reach full capacity. I also wanted to let you know the CIS enrollment date is November 10th, um, so just keep that in mind. Um, the second item on the compliance checklist is about required documentation and age eligibility. Um, Children who are age eligible for kindergarten cannot be enrolled in the program. Um, files should include all bulleted items on the compliance checklist. Uh, proof of income, family income should be on file. Um, there's examples of this listed on um, the compliance checklist. Uh, and for returning students, income does not need to be collected unless they're moving to a different program, such as moving from PFA to PFAE. Uh, the files can be electronic and the birth certificate should be the official copy, not the hospital issued copy. Maddie, I'm gonna jump in and address a couple of things. Um, somebody asked about what the CIS enrollment for November 10th, that's your enrollment for the student information system where you go in and you enter which children are um, enrolled in your program. You you are supposed to, it's an ongoing thing, but you should definitely have the first batch entered by November 10th. That's how we check, we start to check for enrollment after November 10th. So to the other question that asked, what if we're not fully enrolled? The assessors aren't looking at enrollment. Um, I mean, they are looking at who's there that day and who you have, who you have enrolled to this point, but they're not it's early childhood development department handles anything to do with an under enrollment. So we don't expect you to be fully enrolled until November 11th. And we know that, you know, you may be saving spots for um, children who are turning three or things like that. So um, it's fine if you're not at 15 or 20 by the time the assessors come out there. 
Um, I'm looking at a question that says, what about students with an IEP? Can they still be in the program if they are kindergarten age? Uh, and the answer is no. The, um, that that no longer is a uh, that no longer applies the student if the student has an IEP. Uh, as long as the child is kindergarten age eligible, they cannot be enrolled. And that was um, verbiage that came out to all programs. I think sometime in the summer. So if you need that verbiage for any reason, let us know. The manual will probably be changed at some point, but the implementation manual to, rem to remind you is a guiding document. It has resources, but the compliance checklist is what you should always be looking at for up-to-date um, information. Yeah, thank you, good. <laughs> Um, like I mentioned, I believe on the last slide, uh, birth certificate should be the official copy, not the one issued by the hospital um, for number two. And then possible file additions could be a behavior support plan, if applicable, and a program transition plan, again, if it applies. Um, the ISBE issued forms can be found on the early childhood webpage. Maddie, let me let me just address a couple of quick things. Um, so once again, children who are age eligible for kindergarten cannot be in PFA regardless of whether they have an IEP or not. Um, children do not have to be three by September one. They just can't be enrolled in PFA until they turn three. So if you have a child, for example, coming from EI and they turn three January fifth, then they can be enrolled in PFA on January fifth. Anything else we're missing, Jenny? Um, I think that's it for now. Some of these are really specific, so they may have to send them to early chai. Go ahead. Okay. Um, item number four is screenings. Uh, so files can include screening results or an IEP. Um, and electronic signatures are acceptable. Children coming from early intervention may have an EI packet in the file that contains screening results, um, but the screening results should be within six months of enrollment into the program. Okay, um, moving on to number six, uh, weighted eligibility and prioritization. Um, all children, must have a weighted eligibility checklist, including children with an IEP. So everybody should have a weighted eligibility checklist on file. Checklist should be tallied to show priority. Um, and the COVID-19 factor was removed from our official uh, weighted eligibility checklist, but programs can still choose to add COVID-19 as, as a factor to the checklist if they wish. Okay, uh, moving on to number seven, class time and calendar. Uh, the minimum class time is two and a half hours per day, 12 and a half hours per week. Remote learning can be used for early, early release days for professional development as indicated on the district calendar, but programs must document remote learning activities by date of distribution and correlate with the calendar and daily lesson plan. Okay, um, let me see what's in here about remote learning. If no remote learning, do we need any documentation? Um, I don't, I think if you're asking about this, that item is only about early dismissal. So if you have an early dismissal and you don't meet your 12.5 hours, then you would need documentation to show the remote learning to make up. Okay, great, that's a thumbs up. Um, can a child do remote learning if they're going on a longer vacation? That we don't do remote learning by children like our requirements are 12.5 hours a week that you're offering for your program and 165 hours a day so it goes at the program level not an individual child level. the 12.5 hours per week does apply no matter what how many months you're operating 
we and yes, you should be getting a copy of this slide deck, I believe. Okay, let's talk about um curriculum. People are already jumping in about lesson plan questions. Good. Um, so yeah, so sessions will look at six weeks of lesson plans. I mean, we're not overly picky at what six weeks. It just needs to be like around the time of your visit. So like you can do the six weeks prior to your window, or you can do like, you know, the week of your window and then the weeks beforehand. It just can't be like three months ago. So six weeks, six consecutive weeks of lesson plans. We, um, on lesson plans, we're looking for the connection to the benchmarks from the IELDS. Um, not just the numbers. Remember, there needs to be some type of keyword or something attached. And then individualization. Um, this has gotten so much better over the years. And so um, one thing I want to make sure everyone knows about is the FAQ on lesson planning on our website under Preschool for All Resources. If you have any questions about individualization, that does um, address it pretty thoroughly. Um, we are looking for specific children initials or names that have a specific individualization tied to something in the lesson plan. So you, so it's not just like, you can't have like a small group in there and all have the same thing. It has to have something specific that, you know, you want to work with with the child and it has to be tied to something in your lesson plan. So it can't just be like an overall goal that you have for the child for the whole year. It needs to be, the assessors need, it doesn't really matter how you show that. It could be on a separate page or on the same lesson plan, as long as you can show um, that it's attached to what's happening currently in the plan. The 25% of children is per week. So over the course of a month, you should have all the children reflected in your lesson plan. Again, that FAQ um, does have some more detailed information if you're needing specific, more specifics about that. There are also examples on our website. There's one pretty detailed example that our assessment team put together under the sample lesson plans under resources. Um, and that does show individualization on that too. I mean, some of them, like that one's really detailed. We're not saying you have to do it exactly that way but there's three different example of lesson plan formats on our website. And yes, the, um, the, it can be the IELDS or the objectives from your um, assessment tool. I see somebody asked about that. So in regards to number 12, I went back last year and listened to the webinar from last year, and there were a lot of questions about the difference between the screening tool and the assessment tool, which I don't see any questions about that yet, but I just want to clarify. The screening tool is something you do as part of your eligibility enrollment process, and the assessment tool is something you do ongoing with three reporting periods. So, you know, a lot of programs use teaching strategies, gold, work sampling, early learning scales, DRDP, there's several research-based assessment tools that you could use. If you have questions about which one you can use, feel free to reach out to us. But so this item is two separate things. Sometimes programs um, kind of mesh it into one, but the assessment tool, like let's just say um, you're using teaching strategies both. You, you are required to complete the entire rating observation. So the, the entire tool does need to be completed for each child. The portfolio is a separate, um, thing. So you have to have a portfolio that reflects at a minimum two benchmarks from the domains that are listed on the slide on the compliance checklist. So in theory, you would have documentation. You may have documentation for every item in your assessment tool. Maybe there are some things that you can, you can assess without actually collecting documentation simply from observations. But as long as you complete the entire tool, that's all we're looking for. The the amount of documentation that you need for the portfolios is only per benchmark. So two benchmarks from each of the domains. We typically just make sure that there's at least one per reporting period, one example. And you have to have, at a minimum, you have to have like an anecdotal note. And then you can have a, some type of sample, like a, a work sample or a photo. Um, it is okay to use the same photo, for example, of multiple children, your note just needs to be um, individualized. 
And of course, we have three reporting periods. If your visit is occurring in the next month or so and your first reporting period hasn't happened, you just really need to explain to them the process. We don't ever go back and look at files from the year before. So all we need to see is that you have like a structure, whether you have something you can show them that you've already started to create, or you can, you know, as long as you're able to explain to them the process, that's all that's needed if your first reporting period hasn't happened. And we will look for narrative summary reports. It's best practice to do a narrative summary report per, per reporting period, but we are only looking for one. Let me see if I can tackle some of these questions. Hold on. So yeah, you can use the objective or the um, IELDS standard. You just have to have words. You can't just use numbers. I, the person who asked Gina about the intentional teaching cards, why don't you send me an email? Because I think I need to ask some more questions about that. Thank you, Cindy, for putting in the FAQ on the lesson plans. So yes, so remember you are, you're going to complete the entire rating tool, or no matter what you use, work sampling, early learning scales, teaching strategies, goals, and then you're going to have your portfolios that are reflected per domain. Um, as if you're being monitored prior to your first reporting period, more than likely, they'll probably talk to the administrator about that. They might ask your teacher about that, but they'll probably also ask your administrator about that. Yes, and if your narratives aren't done yet, you just explain to them. You can even like show them, like if you have like the blank copy of the form, you can just show that to them. Um, a lot of assessment tools have a narrative summary report that goes along with it, like teaching strategies goal. I think it's called family conference form. And then some of the other ones have one. It just has to be something that kind of summarizes um, the assessment. So it shouldn't be something that you just write like, oh, Jenny's really nice and she's really fun in class or something. It has to like be attached to, to the early learning standards or to whatever your um, assessment tool is. Anything can be electronic, so you, it does not have to be paper portfolios. Anything in this whole entire checklist has to, can be electronic. The only thing is that you have to have somebody available to navigate to the assessment team how to find everything. Again, if you're using a different tool for your portfolios, as long as you can access them during the visit, that's fine. Okay, I think we're gonna move on to the next one. Next slide, Susie. So for um, item 13, we're looking for a written plan about transitioning children to kindergarten. That's just a general program plan about what you guys do for kindergarten transition. And then we're looking for the expulsion and suspension policy. So in the administrative rules for early childhood, there are links here on this slide, there's very specifics as to what should be addressed in the suspension and expulsion plan. Um, it shouldn't just be like a statement, we don't suspend and expel. There, there needs to be steps um, that your program um, addresses. And so make sure if you don't already have a policy, or you need to make it more detailed, check the link there to for what should be included. And it needs to be specific to preschool. Like sometimes we see like an expulsion, expulsion policy that's for your whole district, but this, because we have a law that says you can't suspend and expel in preschool, it has to be specific to preschool. Um, before I go on, I see that there's something that says our binders of, oh, I just lost it, our binders of blank documentation. No, we don't, I mean, we just need to see whatever evidence as it can be in the classroom, it can be at the district office, it can be at the administrator's office, like as long as you have examples to meet each of these items, typically I recommend that you have a program binder or electronically um, that kind of is organized by item. Um, when you get your 
when you got your monitoring documentation, there was a document in there from NLU called preparing for the compliance visit. And it kind of broke down like the types of things we're looking at per item. That's the best way to organize it. Um, and then anything that they need to find in the child files or something that, you know, they, they'll do that. Um, regarding the expulsion policy, I mean, it's something, it can be a board policy, but it has to be very specific to preschool and it has to be related to what's in the administrative rules about the steps you would take um, if there is a challenging behavior. I'm not sure. Oh, um, Cindy, can you put the link for the administrative black rules in? It's on the early childhood um, website. We'll drop that I'm in there. Sorry, Jenny, you. which which um, the link? administrative black rules 235. It's on the early childhood, the main early yeah. child page on the left. Sure. hand. OK, next slide. Community collaboration. So this is a big one that um, programs get marked out of compliance. And I just think it's maybe because it's just a little confusing. All The only thing we're looking for here is a one to two page document, a collaboration plan that ex that outlines the ent organizations that your program is going to collaborate with and maybe like a sentence or two of the collaboration. We're not looking for ag partnership agreements. We're just looking for one or two page document. That's like a plan that just says we're going to collaborate with these entities in this in this manner. We are looking for an MOU with the closest Head Start. And I know we get a lot of calls about Head Start programs closing. You do need to have a signed MOU with the closest operating Head Start to your program. If they will not call you back or refuse to sign, and I, I understand that happens, um, you just need to show documentation of your attempts. If you can show the assessors that you know you've called in these days or you've emailed, or, uh, as long as you can show that you've attempted to obtain a signature, that's all all that we need. Going back to the um, assessment tools, if you have not had your first um, reporting period, there. You, again, you can just verbally explain it. They may they may ask you to see anything that's already started. So if you have your portfolios already started, you should show them that. But other than that, you can just verbally explain that. Um, the MOU does not, I don't believe it says annual on the compliance checklist. I mean, it's a good practice to try to get that updated, but we're not looking at the date on that one. We are looking at the date on the collaboration plan, though. The collaboration plan should be updated annually, even if you just change the date at the bottom, um, just to show that you're like, you know, adding any new partners in or anything that has come up. The the reporting periods for your assessment tool are are something your program decides. Typically, I see like October. February, May, like three three times a year, but that's something that your program determines. Okay, I see there's questions coming in already about licensing, so let's jump to that. So licensing is really complicated, as many of you know, and you know we're in such a teacher shortage right now. So the educator licensure department at ISB can answer any specific questions regarding someone obtaining a license. Um, they also suggest that you call your ROE for any specifics to that. But what I can address is what we require for our grant. So we require a teacher with the professional educator license with the early childhood endorsement or a proper temporary approval. There's several different proper temporary approvals um, on the educator license website, but the Gateways Level 5 credential is what's most specific for, for our programs. So you can have some with a, with a gateway level five. It was extended for five more years, which is really exciting. Um, all you need to do is have that on file. Like that's not something you put in Ellis where the teacher licensing information is. That's just something that you have on file. We do allow substitutes. Uh, substitutes are are also kind of a complicated thing. Um, the ad, the ad, 
school code says that a substitute can only be in place for 30 days for a vacancy. Starting January 1, that's changing to 90 days, prior, um, as long as you have approval from the ROE. Those are not things that we like have very specific information about. So I would always suggest like substitutes are allowed in early childhood as long as they have the is be sub license. If you have questions about the days and the approvals, that's something you should definitely check with your um, ROE about. The paraprofessional does have to have the actual ISBE paraprofessional educator. Uh, they can't just have like the child care, you know, they can't be just qualified to be a child care assistant. They have to have the ISBE para license. Um, of course, if the teacher is providing IEP services, they also need the special ed endorsement. And if they, um, there's a lot, bilingual endorsements are very complicated. There's the bilingual endorsement or the ESL endorsement. I'm going to talk a little bit in a minute about the bilingual FAQ. Um, if you need to know which um, endorsement your teacher needs based on the number of children that you serve, um, that document will explain that very specifically. I see that there's a question about pairs working with a sub certificate. I just want to verify that because I don't want to give the wrong information. So you can send me an email about, about that. So the push-in teachers, we're not looking for um, documentation for the push-in teachers. So we're only looking at documentation for the lead teacher and the para that includes their professional development plans. We're not looking for professional development plans for anyone else but the teacher and the para. If you have questions about specific subs and if they're allowable, send us an email. Um, regarding if I see there's a question if there's a teacher that has an English section and a Spanish session, will they monitor both sections? It has to do with the physical classroom. So we will monitor every physical classroom that your program has. So if it's two sessions in the same classroom, we're only going to monitor that classroom once. Okay. Regarding the time periods for licensing, I really can't speak to that since that's a different department. I What I will say is that we do require that the um, teacher or para has the license prior to, you know, being paid for with grant funds. There, I used, I thought that there was an example of a professional development plan on our website. So check under resources, preschool for all resources, there's like a running list of all kinds of items. And there's also some resources in the implementation manual. So check there, there might be an example. Cindy, can you check the admin code for the, um, Expulsion, we might have the wrong number in there. And the, in the in administrative block rules 235, it's um, towards the back. Okay, you want the the code for expulsion? The, yeah, it's I it's towards the back of that document because it was added in just a couple of years ago. Okay. You know what I'll add is we can take the links that we're talking about in this session and we'll put them in the follow-up email. So if people are, you know, trying to keep up with, yeah, I think you're right, Jill. <laughs> She's saying is to, okay. Um, but we can Thank put you. the links in the follow-up email as well. So that might make it easier for people to have all the links in one place. So there, I see that there's a question back to the, um, portfolios, it's two benchmarks per domain that's listed on the compliance checklist. You have to have documentation for two benchmarks per domain. If you want to talk that out, feel free to call or email us. Okay, let's move on to number 16. Parent guardian involvement, I know everybody does such a great job at this, but um, we just are looking for documentation of involvement, virtual or in-person. Um, family education is totally acceptable. Um, of course, we cannot allow um, programs, families to be charged for anything. So no registration fee, 
no uniform fee, no supply fees. Um, they can't be required to bring in supplies, um, those type of things. Next slide. So the home language survey um, is a requirement of all preschool programs that are administered by a public school district. Susie, can you just flip the slide? So there was an update recently to the FAQ document. I think we're gonna put the FAQ document in the chat um, for providing bilingual services, but it does say that it applies to any entity um, administered by a public school district or an ROE. So I, I think that that might be a different change. So if you have any questions about that, if you're an ROE, feel free to call me. But so what that's saying is that if you're a ROE or a school district or you're administered by a school district, you're required to file the bilingual rules. So if you are a child care center and you're in a subcontracting agreement with a school district, meaning you get your money from the school district, then you are required to follow the bilingual rules. If you are the grantee, the grant in IWAS is in your name as the child care center, then you don't have to follow the rules for bilingual. Of course, it's best practice, in, but you know, but it isn't in the school code that way. We do, so anybody, um, um, any preschool program administered by a school district does need to have the home language survey for every child. It is very, um, the ISB one is on, the ISB website, it's in the lots of languages. There are two specific questions like that you have to have. You can't like make up your own. It has to be specific to what is on the home language survey in code two to eight of the school code and it's specific on the website. So if you just go to the ISB search and type in home language survey, you'll be able to find it. Oh, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, do you want me to read you some of these questions, Jenny? Um, let me go back. I hate jumping around, but it's hard. We lose track of the question, so I apologize for that. Um, so we don't like wish lists. Back to 16. I'm going to be honest. We don't like wish, wish lists. This is a program for at-risk families and students, and we prefer you do not do that. Um, we get we give money to programs to be able to purchase supplies. And so um, will you be marked out of compliance for that? Not if it's Not if it's not required, but we don't recommend it. And no, they're not supposed to be required to purchase uniforms in preschool for all. Um, let's see, there's a question about family education involvement. The family education piece can be something that's offered to everyone, like not just preschool families, as long as you can show that preschool families were specifically invited to it. The home language survey is yes, the one that's done with registration, that's fine and it does have to be um, in their file. It can be electronic. The home language survey only has to be done once upon enrollment for preschool. So if they're a two year student, they don't have to do it again. So there should be some, it does need to be signed. There's, if you're doing it electronically, you gotta find some way to have some kind of record that they, whether it be a digital signature or something. So Christina, your question about the online registration process, I would look at the FAQ document that was put in the chat um, from, cause that's through the multilingual department It may address that. Um, as long as you, on our end, as long as you're able to show the assessment team where the home language survey is for the children files, then um, it doesn't matter to us how it's collected. So there's a question about, um, this is not really an item we have addressed yet, but is there any minimum daily outdoor play requirement? That's not, so that is not a requirement for PFA. When we get to expansion, that is there's a 60 minute um, requirement for gross motor time. Now, with that being said, Eckers, we do expect you to follow the Eckers standards. Um, gross motor time is 30 minutes for every three hours of program operation. The home language survey has to be the ISB home language survey. 
on the ISBE website. It can't be something from your assessment tool or district created. Um, I'm not sure that question about can you repeat if you are your own grantee, that was in regards to child care centers. If you're a child care center and you're your own grantee, you are not responsible for the bilingual um, requirements, even though they're best practice. We'll come back. I'm going to come back to some of these questions that aren't things that I have addressed yet. So center-based programs, child care, do not have to have the home language on survey unless they're administered by the school district. Right. If your program is 2.5 hours, it's the 30 minutes is prorated. I always re recommend 30 minutes, though, because when you um, count in like transition time, like walking from the classroom to the playground and stuff, it tends to eat up your time. So as much as possible, I would try to hit that 30 minutes. Okay, I'm gonna go on to um, 18 is about the screening procedure. So you do the home language survey. You also have a screening procedure policy that shows what you're going to do if the child is identified um, through the home language survey, that you do have to screen them. All the specifics to that are on that FAQ document. If you have not seen that FAQ document, multilingual department updates it all the time. We did a webinar on it um, last, all I think that will be is archived on the um, early child professional learning YouTube channel. So if you have specifics about that, I would definitely check that out because multilingual department was part of that webinar. Next slide. Um, number nineteen or nineteen, Susie, sorry. Um, nineteen is a one that we get a lot of questions about. So the annual self assessment and your continuous quality improvement plan are two different things. So your annual self-assessment is something that your program should be doing that's like a program evaluation to the families. It could be peer observations using ECHRs. Some programs use class. It needs to be something that you as a program do annually to help inform your continuous quality improvement efforts. Then the second piece of that is your CQIP that you submit after your monitoring visit that um, I just mentioned earlier. And one thing about the CQIPs, I'm gonna give a little plug here. So every, or a push, um, every May, we send out an email that if you're not monitored in that year, that you need to update your CQIPs. A lot of programs don't submit those and we have to have those on file. And we've been hunting down people and we're gonna continue to hunt down people. So if you did not submit your CQIP last May and you were not monitored last year, FY23, even if you're being monitored this year, you still need to have that FY23 update on file. So that's a compliance, so that's two documents, a compliance update where you fill out those follow-up columns. And then there's the ECHRs where you submit, where you fill out the reflection part on the bottom of the, each item. And then you submit your five new goals for next year. So kudos to all of you who have submitted those and please submit those if you haven't. And those go to ECPIP, P-I-P, at ISB.net. So the Continuous Quality Improvement Plan is what we talked about at the beginning in relation to your monitoring report. So once you get monitored, you're going to have 30 days to submit your CQIP. And it's a it's addressing your compliance, non-compliance issues. And you also have an ECHRS CQIP where you select five items in the ECHRS tool that your program wants to work on. And there'll be a lot more details um, when you get your monitoring reports. So if you're in year one, you will not, if you were new last year, you're not gonna have a CQIP. If you were just funded last year and you're being monitored this year, you're not going to have a CQIP, but you do need a self-assessment. So hopefully at the end of your first year, you did some type of self-assessment, whether it's, even if it's like a teacher survey or something, something a document that you, um, that you guys did kind of think about improvements for the following year. All the CQIP documents are on the Preschool for All website under accountability liaisons. 
We don't currently have an example. I mean, a lot of people ask us about CQIPS examples, but we just, we're not able to provide one um, to this point. But definitely if you, I think that's, that's an item where if you have any um, friends from a different district or a different program, that would be a good thing to um, ask them about. You, you do an update of your CQIP for every year that you're not monitored. A parent survey is totally acceptable for, um, for your self-assessment, yes. If you don't think you, if you have questions about the CQIP updates, email us. It's two documents. One is the compliance update that has the follow-up columns and one is the Eckers update. So if you were monitored last year and you submitted your CQIP after your monitoring visit, you're not going to do anything until May of this year. May of this year, you'll be emailed and say, hey, it's time for you to complete your update. You do have to use the CQIP documents that are for ISB on the ISB website. If you haven't been monitored, you're going to submit your CQIP after your monitoring visit. There are a lots of administrator trainings that we do over the course of the year. Cindy, I don't know if, are you able to speak or send any information about any administrator academies? I see that there's um, some questions about that. Yes, definitely. They can go to our um, ECPL website, which we will also include. I can put it in the chat. And we'll include it in the follow-up email. It's eclearningil.org. Um, if they go to our website, they can see um, under the e-learning option, the administrator academies that are being offered. We are trying to use survey data from administrators for providing additional administrator forum series sessions like this. So um, we we constantly have things happening for administrators. And I understand that there are some new administrators. So we are also trying to address that as well. Um, I don't think we have any sample of self-assessments. The biggest one that I see is the Eckers assessments that like maybe your instructional leader might complete on your classroom or um, teacher, like one teacher observes another teacher's room. We see that a lot. School improvement plans are fine as long as they're like have something specific to preschool in there. If you, if you were monitored last year, that would be the most recent CQIP you have on file. So yes, that's what you would show the monitors. You show the monitors whatever your most recent update is. Okay, let's go on to 20. So for 20, um, we're looking for that the majority of supports and services are pushed in versus pull out. So we always use this, like the majority of services for the majority of children happen in the classroom. So I'm gonna give a really easy example. So if you pull out every child for speech, if somebody pulls out every child for speech, then that would not be compliant. But if you have five children who receive speech services and only one of those children is pulled out, that's okay. So it's the majority of services for the majority of the children happen in the class. We know that sometimes there's reasons for that not happening and that's okay. It just can't be all pull out. And we, and this is an item that like we completely realize that at the early childhood level is not always in your control. So like, especially if you're like a childcare center and your children have to go somewhere to get the services, um, as long as you indicate in your CQIP that, you know, you're working towards, whether that be in conversation or something, trying to get services in the classroom, then that's all that we're looking for there. Um, someone asked, do we need the social worker to announce their role when they come in so the monitors know? No, I think if they if the monitors have any questions about who's in the classroom and for what reason, um, they'll ask. Yeah, the 
they're just going to ask you about this. So if you have some way of showing them, you know, a, a schedule of, you know, if there's children who get pulled out or you can just verbally explain it, we don't need anything very detailed. So we want you got, we want a hundred percent pushing. <laughs> so, but we but we realized to some. I'm not exactly sure the um specific questions, but um if you have any specific questions about um special ed and what's allowable, please email us and we'll send it to our special ed consultant. But um we do want you to strive for pushing. But if you if you can't, that's okay in, in some cases. I don't know, somebody said they can't hear me, but can everyone else hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> um, yeah, Joanna, why don't you email me about that? Because that's kind of specific, your question. The teacher interview, we don't, like, we don't have a formal teacher interview. We'll, we'll just ask for any clarification about things that we can't see. So they're just going to ask about how your IEP, ser if you have a, if the teacher has children in the classroom with IEP services, they're just going to ask about how the IEP services are um, provided. Okay, let's see if we can quickly address a few expansion items. Remember, if you're expansion, you're, you're responsible for one to 20 and 21 to 37. If you don't have expansion, you're not responsible for 21 to 37, so you can tune us out right now, unless you think you'll ever want to have expansion, and then you can listen. <laughs> Good, Maddie. Okay, um, next slide, please. All right, number 21 for PFAE is about full day. Um, PFAE sessions must meet the length of instructional time that is equivalent to that provided by the first grade teacher. So it should be no less than five hours per day. Um, and if the in-person hours are less than the minimum time due to early release, then remote learning opportunities must be provided. Number 23 is about weighted eligibility. Um, you must use the state issued weighted eligibility form at a minimum. Um, there must be a minimum of 80% of enrolled children that have at least two risk factors or one highest priority selection. Uh, it can be three or four years old with no federal poverty level requirement and the program uh, should collect and review proof of family income to determine priority points. Okay, uh, I see a question. It says, do remote learning activities need to be provided if the first graders in the district have an early release as well? No, only if it affects your hours. Yep. Okay, item number 28, comprehensive services. Um, so dental screenings are only required once during the entire time that a child is enrolled in PFAE. Um, mental health screenings can be part of the general screening process, such as ages and stages questionnaire. Um, programs should contact con should contract with qualified mental health provider or consultants, and families are should be connected to a medical and dental home. Um, they should be uh, connected to them. Uh, but you can also refer to the PFAE section of the PFA implementation manual for the role of a mental health consultant. Mandy, let me jump in here about. Um... So you would have to check for sure for with the child care um, reimbursement. But as far as we know, if you're operating for more than five hours a day for PFA or PFAE, then a child cannot be claimed as a full-time voucher for child care subsidy. It would have to be part-time voucher. If you're less than five hours, you can still claim the full-time voucher. Okay, hey, anything else? A 
Okay, for 32, we're looking for case notes. We will pull the same seven files that we pulled for the other items, for the PFA items. So we're just looking for, I mean, we don't have like a specific description of what the case notes need to look like. And it just needs to show that you have had some type of, um, you know, conversations with parents, any follow-up that happens about something that the family might need, anything that you refer the family to should all be um, documented in your case notes. And in this item, um, we're also looking for a written plan that details um, the services um, to families and agencies you will collaborate with. So a little more detailed than that one on um, number 16 in PFA. Next one, Parent Advisory Council. Um, we do require Parent Advisory Councils for expansion. Um, you just need to have like a schedule of your dates or when you're planning to meet if you haven't um, met yet. Virtual meetings are acceptable. The council can be part of the larger group for your district as long as it shows that you have specific preschool for all expansion involvement. Um, ECPL does a great webinar on parent advisory councils. I think it actually just happened, um, so it should be archived on the ECPL um, YouTube channel. For, I know we didn't talk about the credentials of the family educator, but um, they don't need a specific degree. They just need to have background um, in early childhood or other related, the compliance item specifically states um, the related experience that they need to have. For family education items for um, expansion, this is a little above and beyond what, what we look for in PFA. Um, we're just looking for some general um, PD family education items under medical, dental health, mental wellness, um, family strengthening, just as long as you have something in those categories is what we're looking for. We also are looking that you are giving families an opportunity to provide input. So like an assess, like a survey at the beginning of the year or something like that. Typically um, for the family educators um, and the instructional leaders, like if you need to show experience, it's typically on a resume. Instructional leaders do need a bachelor's degree. Oh, I'm tired. So that's a lot of information. Um, I know, I know we didn't catch all the questions because they're coming in so fast. So um, I don't, Susie, are they able to unmute at this point or can do we should we still stick it put the questions in the chat? Uh we still have quite a few people, but if they, you know, just can uh, unmute to ask their questions on an individual basis, I'm sure that would be fine. Um, let me address a couple of things that are coming in. So yeah, I didn't talk about USDA um items because those are pretty specific to whatever food program you're looking that you are enrolled in. So, I mean, we're just looking that the basic USDA guidelines for preschool programs are um, being adhered to. So like for snack, we're just looking for like the two components um, meet USDA guidelines. All the specifics as to like substitutions and things like that, you should definitely check with your um, either the school nutrition program or the child care food program. Snacks are only required for PFA unless you're full day PFA, then you should have at least a meal. Preschool for all expansion, we require breakfast, lunch, and snack. The family advisory council item is not for PFA. Remember 21 to 37 is specific to expansion. Cindy, would you be willing to talk about the on-demand course for Eckers? Sure. So um, the on-demand course for Eckers is it's done um, through registration through ECPL. Let me, I'm going to actually pull up the description so I don't misspeak on this. Let me look it up. Here it is. It's a two-part uh, it's, it consists of a recording of two parts. And so uh, part one is going over uh, the tool for self-reflection. It defines terms. 
you understand the scoring procedures for self-assessment and how you can use the Eckers 3 data as a tool for continuous quality improvement. So that might help you with your CQIP on that. And the part two explores quality practices with uh, subscale indicators, language and literacy, learning activities and program stru structure. For each part, there's a journal for self-reflection and action planning. There's also resources. Again, they can register on our website. They can go right to our homepage. There's a, there's a, there's, it's, it's in what's new trending. We always kind of keep the Eckers 3 on-demand training uh, uh, on that homepage. If they want to get credit, for this, uh, for a, for participating or completing the journals and the other requirements involved with this, then they have to submit that to us. That's just the only thing that we want them to know. They don't have to do it for credit, but if they want to get credit for it, they would have to submit the requirements in order for us to give them professional development hours. Thanks, Cindy. Let me um, jump into a few more of these questions. So about the screening, um, all we're looking for is that you have evidence that the screening results were shared with the family. That can look a variety of ways. It doesn't have to be a formal signature. Um, if you're offering breakfast instead of snack, that's totally fine because you're meeting at least the minimum snack components as long as it happens in the hours of the class, PFA classroom. Um, there's a question about using the teapot for pyramid model um, for a self-assessment. Yes, that's a great example. The remote learning is only for early dismissals that cause your class to meet less than the 12.5 hours. So if you, for example, every um, Wednesday, you are out an hour early and you only have 11 hours instead of 12.5, then you have to do remote learning. But if you still, if you're meeting more than 2.5 hours per day, you probably won't have an issue with that one. Let's see. So remote learning, we don't require remote learning ever. Really, I mean, if your district uses remote learning for um for snow days, that like we would count that as an attendance day. Like we're not going to mark you out if you're closed for a snow day. If your district requires that you um do that, I mean, that's okay, but we're not required. So can I ask if you um in regard to this same question, if you have your one hundred and sixty five days. Um, of attendance days, and you have some built-in PD days where there's no children on those days, do you have to re still provide remote learning for those days? No, remote learning is only required in the hour requirement, so the under 12.5 hours. If you already have 165 days, then that's fine. Does that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. PFA programs runs from um, 8.30 to 3.30, but has an early release. I'm not sure. I, Amy, um, I think you're asking the early dismissals are only about programs that will not meet for 12.5 hours a week. So my question was, is that for, you had mentioned it was for PFA, but right. we are PFAE. So do we also follow that 2.5 hours a day or whatever? That or wouldn't typically affect you because you're probably meeting way more than 12.5 hours a week. It would I only would be so. if your early dismissal causes you to meet under 12.5 hours. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sure. So your question, Stephen, about enrolling students with a higher priority score that you can't get a hold of, I think as long as you're able to show your weighted eligibility like spreadsheet that shows the points and then if you have like any notes or anything next to it that you know your attempts to call that that's perfectly fine 
Okay. So if we, there's not like a set number of contacts that we have to make to show, I mean, we've, we've tried calling a lot of these families and they just, uh, their phones are turned off or they're, you know, it, it, there's been some issues with that and we're trying to contact, we just can't get a hold of them. Yeah. No, as long as you have your spreadsheet and then you have any like notes next to it, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. What up, Maddie? Did we forget anything? I feel like we probably did, but <laughs> not that I can think of right now. But um, again, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to email early chai at isb.net. We'll try our best to answer your questions, especially the ones that are more specific. Yes. And we still have a few more minutes, so I'm happy to um, answer a few more. Um, I have a question. If you are have students with um, some individual behavior plans that have IEPs in the PFA classroom that are maybe even to the point that they're having to run like a school within a school system with an individual TA and they have to spend time outside of the classroom doing things, is that okay to keep going? Can the teacher explain, walk that through with their monitor? So they they do have an IEP? Yes. And it's all laid out within. So that would fall under that majority of services for the majority of time. So mm -hmm. it would just sort of depend on how many children you have and how, um, you know, much they're being pulled out. I mean, again, this is an item that like we understand for there's a lot of different reasons that it may not be met. So as long as you can explain it in your sequence and, you know, work towards trying to provide those services in the classroom, that's all we're looking for. Okay. This recording is going to be on the YouTube channel for ECPL. So Early Child Professional Learning, their YouTube channel is all archived. You can watch last year. You can watch this year's. Thanks, Jenny. And it's also, when you go to our channel, you'll see there's a whole section for administrators. And so that's where all these sessions are, in addition to anything else that we've done that um, supports administrators. So there's a question about a sample document for prioritizing enrollment. So so we're when we talk about that, we're talking about your weighted eligibility criteria. We don't have the sample for PFA. We do have an, we do have a required form for preschool for all expansion. It's on the preschool for all expansion website. It's called the weighted eligibility checklist. That is definitely a start good starting point. If you don't have one and you need to look at what one looks like. Um, that's definitely, I mean, PFA has more flexibility in the categories and the point values, but that's definitely an example. And so then you should be totaling, each child should have one of those. You should be totaling that and then your spreadsheet should show, you know, the order at each child and their points and how they, that will show how you enroll them. If you have any questions about like the monitoring visit as it comes up, you know, please feel free to reach out to Maddie and I. There was a question about PI. PI, I think, just had their. Maddie, did they just have their compliance webinar? I think they did. Yes, I um, believe they just did. I'm check with Start Early is their TA provider. Um, so you might want to look on their website. They may have reported it. I'm not for sure. Oh, Penny, thank you. It didn't happen already. That must have been another topic. Uh, November. Thank you, Penny. How do they register? I'm assuming through the Start Early website. Thank you. All right, Susie, I guess you could. Um... Jenny, someone was asking. Oh, I'm sorry, Jenny. Someone was asking about the link for the recordings in the YouTube channel. So you can either go to YouTube and our handle for YouTube is at ECPL, or you can go to our website and on the homepage, scroll all the way down to where the social media icons are, and you'll see the icon for YouTube, and that will take you directly to our YouTube channel. I also pasted the link to the oh, ECPL thanks. YouTube on the chat. Thanks. 
Well, thank I you all. Um, I'll pass it over to Susie, but just want to um, again plug the administrator forum in person, April 22nd and 23rd, so we can see you in person. Okay, great. Thank you again, everybody. Um, what we have up on the screen right now is the next administrator virtual session, which is scheduled for Wednesday, November 8th. And the subject is early childhood education and care expulsion and suspension. And it uh, pr is presented by Dr. Antoinette Taylor. And it again will be in the same time slot from one o'clock to 2.30 p.m. So uh, registration is open for that right now at the ECPL website at eclearningil.org. So you can go ahead and register for that. And then uh, keep an eye out for all the upcoming details and the registration uh, for the live administrator forum that it's going to be held in Champaign in April. We're very excited about that. We're excited to get everybody back in person and looking forward to seeing everybody. And again, if you do have any additional questions, you can still type them in the chat room. We're going to be on here till at least 2.30. Or email early try be that. Yes. You will be uh, also getting a follow-up email that is going to have um, a link for an evaluation that we would ask if you could please complete for us so that we can plan accordingly for future administrator sessions. Thank you, Jenny and Maddie. We appreciate you going through this with us and answering all the questions that you can <laughs> as they come into the chat and for offering support through earlychai at isby.net. That's one email address I do not forget. I'm trying to answer some of the questions um, directly that are in the chat. 